Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Ingo from Rapid Miner. I'm really happy to present to you today and um, yeah, give you my presentation about how to ruin your business with data science. Of course, I know that most of you won't be here really for learning how to ruin the business, but actually how to avoid it um, and in general do a better job as a data scientist. But um, yeah, and, and with machine learning, but, but we will actually cover both of uh, those, those elements in this presentation. So let me share my screen here. Okay, so um, this is the presentation, how to ruin your business with data science and machine learning. Um, and before we really get into the ruin part and, and figure out what are the things you can actually do wrong with machine learning, let's discuss a little bit uh, what is at stake here and what is actually the upside if you do it right. So um, I would like to discuss two specific examples. Both are very well-known companies. Um, the first one is Amazon, actually. Um, Think about Amazon, they are an amazing company with, I think, I remember it was like $130 billion in revenues last year. Um, and a lot of this revenue, of course, is, it's, it's a retail company, but a lot of this revenue is created and generated by their machine learning systems, specifically as a result of their recommender systems. And they never really publish the exact numbers, but a lot of insiders believe that between 15 and 20% of their revenues are by now generated uh, through up and cross selling through their recommendations. And that is an amazing number. I mean, I like, let's say it's even only 10. Well, I take this 10% increase at that revenue range, like in a heartbeat, of course. So this is a great success story. So you, we have examples where things can re go really, really well. Um, there's probably an even better example. Um, and this is uh, Google AdWords. Uh, Google, I think I remember had $60 billion in revenues um, through the AdWords program. And my claim is that basically 100% of all those revenues are a direct result of matching whatever people are looking for and are interested in um, with commercial offers. And this matchmaking, again, is mainly driven by some form of machine learning. So this is really probably one of the biggest success stories which are out there, and that is awesome. Last example I would give is actually both. There's a positive example, but also it turned into a negative example. That will bring us into the problems and the risks. The last example, this might be a little bit less well-known in the United States, but probably well-known in the rest of the world, especially in the UK, is the company Tesco. Um, Tesco has been around for some time. I think it's the largest uh, uh, retailer in, in, in the UK, if I remember correctly. And they started very early investing into um, collecting data, into investing into modeling the data and figuring out um, what to do with this. Actually, in the mid of the 90s already in the first, actually it was already the second wave of, of data mining, really. Um, so they started collecting the data. You see the timeline at the bottom, uh, around 1995. They only covered like 10% of all the data of what they're doing. But then it took them like six, six seven years, and um, they captured basically everything. And they started um, investing in programs, and they worked very, very well. In fact, in those 15 years, they have been increasing their profits by 7x as a direct result of this. And that was amazing as a success story, but then something happened, actually multiple things happened, and they got into trouble. So the first thing is they had a pretty, well, wrong investment, or investment which didn't work out that well when they tried to enter the US American market, which didn't really work very well, actually. Um, so that was one big problem for sure. But the other big problem, well, there was two more problems. One, there was a couple of like fishy uh, accounting practices, but let's not go into this one here. And then the last one really is they actually had to write up 416 million in profits. And a large part of this, people believe, was because actually all the analytics they did backfired. It turned against them, mainly because customers felt that Tesco was collecting way too much data and used it in a way that only Tesco profits from this, but no longer the customer. So customers didn't feel comfortable any longer with sharing the data with Tesco and looked for alternatives. And that had a huge impact on their profits. So this was really kind of like a, an example where things started to go very well. And then actually things all have been um, going down from there. So what is the difference? If you think about those examples like Amazon and Google, and there are many, many more where the companies use machine learning very successfully, and then there are cases where it didn't work all that well. And there are actually more cases, often you can't find the correct, the, the, the actual numbers, because well, companies tend to not talk a lot about their losses. But um, there are a lot of examples. We will see another one a little bit later in this presentation. But what is the difference between those two groups? And in order to answer this question, it's obvious that we absolutely have to analyze alien life forms. Um, 
So don't jump away from this presentation or it all will make some sense in a, in a minute. So let's analyze some aliens. Um, in fact, let's answer the question, what can UFO sightings tell us about extraterrestrials? And now this is an interesting database here. And if you're into text analytics, I can highly recommend this to everybody. It's a fun data set to work with. It is a data set coming from the New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center. And it contains, uh, well, descriptions about more than 80,000 UFO sightings over the past decades. So um, let's have a look into this data. Before we even get to machine learning, really, let's actually do some more, more simple stuff. Let's, for example, let's have a look into this chart here. And this chart shows us the total number of reported UFO sightings per year since 1963. And well, if you look carefully, you can, and if, even if you don't look carefully, it's easy to spot this point, which is orange, the year 1993. Something happened in that year, and all of a sudden, there were, have been more UFO sightings reported. So, I, as, as I said in the beginning, I would like to make this as interactive as possible. So, think about this. What do you think could have happened in 1993? And type it into the check box. Um, I will give you a couple of seconds and I would love to hear your thoughts. What you think what might have happened in 1993? So give it a thought and well, type it into the chat box. Any idea? Nothing is wrong here. The first answer is coming in. The internet. This is, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ita. This is a, this is a great, um, great idea. Video cam also good. Internet is great, sounds good, it is wrong though. Um, it was not the internet. First of all, the internet as a in technology infrastructure has been around since the 60s already, but the World Wide Web, which was really kind of like creating the boom around the internet, has been um, published or widely used in, from 1996. It wasn't um, Bill Clinton and mobile phones, I'm not sure, have been around, but not widely used. No, nope, that's all not it. No, nope, I tell you what the answer is. Ah, ah, closer, the movie ET came out. That was in the 80s, actually. And here we have the winner, and actually it is coming from some person with the name Win. It is the X-Files. In 1993, in September 1993, actually the first episode of the X-Files has been aired in the United States. And many people just chat right now that they love the show, and many people did. So think about this, the first episode was only, only seen by like 5 million people, but at its peak, more than 25 million viewers watched the show every week. And that was, at that time, far more than 10% of the total US population. And then worldwide, it was also a big success. But think about this, actually, I think they did, well, Nielsen and all the other people who actually collect the data about how many viewers are there, they did it wrong because they only looked into the human viewership, in fact, what really happened is that, of course, aliens also picked up the radio waves from the X-Files, started to watching the shows. So obviously, it's in aliens are huge fans of the X-Files. They come to Earth and they watch the show together with us. I mean, it's clearly here in the data. You, you can easily see this. Um, so it has to be the reason, that, right? I mean, there's no other reason here. So and then another idea here. Uh, let's have a look into this chart here. This chart actually describes the proportion of all the reported UFO sightings by hour and day. And look at this now. Um, blue means that there is not a lot of UFO sightings. Yellow or, yeah, well, this yellow color means there is a lot of UFO sightings. And you can clearly see there is more UFO sightings in the evening. And the most UFO sightings are actually on Saturday night. And I, I don't believe that this is just some coincidence that the number of UFO sightings just happens to occur at the same time most fraternity parties happen. I mean, the real reason is we already saw before that aliens are very social beings. They come down to Earth to watch the X-Files with, uh, with us. And of course, they also come to Earth, immediately adapt to our weekly and daily schedules and start to party with us on Saturday nights. So clearly aliens are social being, they work very hard during the work days, just like we do, and then they party very hard as well. I mean, again, totally obvious it's all in the data and then on the last example here this is the average number of reported ufo sightings per week since 2010 um so the average over all those years and well obviously there is a huge peak in the week of fourth of july and again i think my fellow german uh, well not friend but um well ronald emmerich 
the, the uh, director of the movie Independence Day, he got it all wrong. He depicted aliens coming to Earth on the Independence Day to destroy the White House and, and destroy whole humanity. But that is not why they're coming here. We saw already they are actually social beings. They work with us. They party with us. And of course, aliens as social beings not coming to Earth to destroy us. They come to Earth because they do love America and they do love fireworks. It's all in the data. So, of course, those are silly examples. But are they? I mean, and again, we all, I hope at least, it's hard to because I'm not getting a reaction, but of course, you, I hope you got the irony behind all of this. This is all, those are valid interpretations. By just looking to the data, you could interpret this like that. Of course, at the same time, you could also say like, well, wait, it's the exiles and people start believing in aliens. And well, people are just drunk. That's why they see more aliens. And on 4th of July, there's a lot of fireworks and people mistake them as aliens. Those are equally valid explanations, but mine are true as well. There's nothing in the data which proves us that this is wrong. And this brings us back to the question, what are really the underlying problems when you analyze data? This was, was not even machine learning, but we will see some of the problems connected to machine learning in a minute as well. What are the underlying problems? What are things people can do wrong? I mean, we made a lot of mistakes around the aliens and it's easy to make them. And in case of the aliens, it's easy for us to detect them as well, but that's not always that easy. So that brings me to the first problem. So there are three big problems. The first one is in fact still the confusion between correlation and causation. It happens every single day. And I will give you a, kind of like a business example, although it's coming from a, from a government um, scenario, um, but you see how wrong things can actually go if you do it wrong. Then the next topic I see done wrongly in hundreds of cases. I mean, like I, I am afraid to say, I mean, I'm doing data science since more than 15 years now. Um, it wasn't even calling, called data science back then. I used machine learning, like, I don't know, same time really since 15 years now. I saw it so often, especially um, in organizations, but even in research actually as well, that people incorrectly validate their models. And it's not just about cross-validation. That is just the tip of the iceberg. You can do a lot of wrong things if you validate your models. Um, and most people, unfortunately, do it wrong. And then the last one, if you still have time at the end, I would also like pick one topic which is interesting for myself because I did this wrong myself a lot of times, especially when I was less experienced and a bit younger, um, that people focus way too much on the machine learning models themselves and not enough on the data and the data prep. So whatever is the latest hype, deep learning, gradient booster trees, whatever it is, they always value this way too high. Yes, those are good models, but they don't replace, they still don't, even deep learning doesn't, like thinking about your data. And I will give you a couple of examples for that one as well. Okay, so let's get a little bit deeper into the weeds here. Um, so I'll start with the first problem, the confusion between correlation and causation. I would like to give you another example for that, um, as I said before, coming from a govern, government scenario. So in 20, no, it was, uh, when was it? In 2003, I think, 2003, 2004. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but somewhere around then. There was a research um, done in Chicago, in, in Illinois, and this research actually came out with the result. Well, they, they counted how many books are in homes and what are the, how are the children doing in school for their test marks. And they figured out, like, well, if there are more books in, in the home, then the higher um, the, the test marks actually are and the children are doing better. And that actually makes some sense. I mean, if there's a lot of books, people, the children can read things and then they can learn more, they get more interested in new th stuff. Um, and then, well, they and this, have this attitude of learning and then they do better and they test it. I, it makes total sense. And that also made a lot of sense to the governor of Illinois back then, a gentleman called Rod Blagojevich. I mean, let's not con comment on this gentleman in, at all because later on he was kind of like, in a huge scandal story, but that's not the topic for today. Back then in 2004, he did something not many politicians are actually doing. He came up with a plan which was really focusing on the long-term future, trying to make Illinois a better state. So he came up with a plan that, well, if there are more books than the children do bigger, better in school, then let's give more books to the children. So he thought, let's mail one book per month to every child, to child in Illinois between the time they were born until they entered kindergarten. This plan would cost the state $26 million per year. But his thought was like, well, let's do that. So they're getting better in school. They get better um, educated. Later, they get better jobs. They make more money. They will then pay more taxes. And again, this is good. So that was a pretty long-term vision here. And I applaud Mr. Blagojevich for that one then. Though it turned out 
he made a huge mistake. He's apparently not a good analyst. Because later on, there was more analysis, and this one showed that it didn't matter if they actually read the books or not. Just the fact that there have been books in the home led to better test marks. So my whole theory from before, well, there's more books, so people read more, they become smarter. Probably, it doesn't hold. And there was a bit of follow-up research, and I believe the common belief at this point is that it has nothing to do with the books, actually. It's about the environment the parents provide. So it's all about the parents, actually. If there are more books, that means the parents probably read more. They value education and knowledge higher than if in families where there are zero books. And so the whole environment for the child is actually an environment which supports learning and knowledge and curiosity and everything else. So that led to, to um, better test marks. It's not the book itself because, well, it didn't matter if the children read the book. So think about this. If the plan was actually stopped um, <laughs> just in time for other reasons because nobody wants to pay the 26 billion, uh, million. But he generally wants to push this through. And it would have cost 26 million, but it would have, have zero or almost zero impact. So this is a great... Um, great example. Well, I, I got a question here, and by the way, feel free. I'm not going to answer maybe every single question during the talk and uh, do some at the end, but, uh, but here's an interesting one. Um, it might be that not sending the books to the parents, um, well, this, that might be true, but might not sending books to the parents change the environment they provide for their children? It would if, and they, they might, it might be, yes, you're right, first of all, um, and it would if the parents actually also probably change other behaviors. The fact that they invested money into books in the first place probably is an, just, it's just an indicator, it's a signal that they value knowledge. If they just get the books, it doesn't matter, um, as little matter probably than, than the parents get the book. But if the books would change their behavior overall, yeah, it could have some impact. But again, I don't believe it would be large. Anyway, so this is an, an example, and I will, now would like to do this together with you. Um, so let's go into a piece of software here and let's actually model something together and let's see how easy or not so easy it is to make this mistake. So I just switched my screen. Um, you should be able to actually see, um, well, kind of like a grayish piece of software with a couple of uh, colorful bubbles in the center. Let me know if that's not the case. So this is Rapid Miner, but that doesn't matter actually. I mean, I could show you the same thing with R, Python, or whatever. It's just simpler with Rapid Miner. Um, first of all, I like it a little bit more. <laughs> it's a little bit biased here. But the other element is just, it's very visual. You can code, but you don't have to. So that means that we can easily all follow along. So what you're doing here in this large wide area is you build processes. And in the first step here uh, of this process, this blue one here, we just load a data set about the Titanic accident. So let's have a look into this data set in a second. And after we loaded this data, in the second step here, we perform something which is a cross-validation. Uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is about validating the accuracy, the predictive performance of a machine learning model. So our goal is going to be to predict who's going to survive the accident and who's not. And this cross-validation here, and I can go inside, uh, I use a gradient boosted trees um, uh, algorithm here inside, which is trained on 90% of the data. And then I basically apply this model on the remaining 10% here on the right side, which never has been seen by the model. And then I go basically through the 10 different blocks of 10% subsets and build the average of the, the predictive power on all those unseen data points, which gives me a good estimate how well this model actually worked. Okay, let's, but let's, let's have a look into the data first. So I execute this process here, uh, and this red dot here means I have a breakpoint here, meaning I stop the process at this point so we can inspect the data. So here's the data set. Uh, as I said, it's about the Titanic accident. There have been 1,309 people on the boat or ship or whatever. And um, in fact, we have a lot of uh, different, um, well, piece of information here. We have the name of all the, of the people. We have very important the information, piece of information if they survived the accident or not. So let's have a look at Miss Allison here, for example. Miss Allison didn't survive. Um, she was from Southampton. Oh, that's uh, tragic. She was a little baby, two years old, a girl. Uh, she was traveling in first class, but that didn't help her either. She didn't survive. All right, so sorry, that was a, that was a sad one. But, but well, he here, or no, uh, another, another woman, Mrs. Uh, Baxter, um, actually she survived um, and she was 50 years old and was only traveling a small family. Anyway, so this is the data. Now I actually run the whole cross-validation with my graded booster trees 
so that's what just happened in, in the background. So basically, I executed this step now here, learning the 10 models and doing, doing all the average building. And we can see that this model is really doing very well. I mean, it is ac its accuracy of the model is 97%. So that means, with the exception of those like 50 cases here, we actually are correct for all the other cases. And this is, again, it's properly cross related So I'm not applying this on the training data or anything. So this is a really good model. I mean, it's really good. I, I, I'm actually, I'm curious, isn't that actually way too good? I mean, 97%, whenever I get a model which is close to perfect, which would be 100%, I'm kind of getting a little bit suspicious. And I'm getting suspicious right now. I, I'd claim this, we, we made a mistake. We just made a mistake in our design of the process here. So again, it's, I'm asking you guys, let's use the chat option again. Does anybody have any idea what we might have been doing wrong? in our design, which led us to a way too good model. Any ideas? And just keep in mind, we are talking about the whole uh, correlation versus uh, causation issue here. What might have been the mistake? I mean, it's, it was hard to see, I admit this, but think a little bit about this. And again, let's pump out all the ideas. There's, well, there are obviously wrong answers, but, but it doesn't matter. I mean, like, uh, you just looked at the data for 30 seconds. I'm not expecting you to come up with this right away. So here's the data again. Uh, the data was not randomized. Well, it was. I mean, the, the, the sampling for the, for the cross-validation was randomized. So there was no bias in terms of, nope, good ideas, both, both of them. But I made sure that I did it uh, right, so I didn't show it to you. But in the cross-validation, you can basically say what kind of sampling would you li like to do. So there's this kind of like sampling type here. Uh, well, I'm using the automatic here, but automatic in this case, it's actually performing a stratified sampling. So there's no skewed. Ah, Marco here has an idea, the lifeboat feature. And this is uh, in fact exactly the right idea. I kept in the information if somebody made it on the lifeboat or not. And that basically means like, well, those people here, they made it on the lifeboat. Well, guess what? They all survived. In, in reality, in the predictions also all survived. This person here didn't make it on a lifeboat, and guess what? <laughs> this person didn't survive. Well, uh, the prediction was also no. And in, actually, if you would have had a look into the model itself, you could see that in this gradient booster trees, the lifeboat is always at the top of this, those trees here. So it's the most predictive um, attribute. But it's wrong to use it. Why is that wrong to use it? Well, because after you made it on the lifeboat, so after you collected the information, if you made it on the lifeboat or not, I mean, you roll the dice already at this point of time. It's already everything is decided. So instead, you could have been modeling who made it on the lifeboat in the first place, or you should have been taking out the, the, the lifeboat out of the, of the data set because, in fact, the, the, if anything, you made it on the lifeboat already, so you can no longer do any action. So there's two reasons. First of all, the correlation between the lifeboat and the, what we want to predict, the label or the class or the target, is way too high and that sometimes is okay that just makes it an easy case but in this case it's not okay that this correlation is so high because the only point in time i can actually do something i mean keep in mind it's 1912 the year 1912 after i boarded the ship it's over i, I mean there's no helicopters who can come to my, for my, my rescue there is no cell phone i couldn't call anybody that's why i explicitly said here in the beginning i would like to predict this at boarding time because that is the last moment where i can make the decision you know what in this case let's not board at all because if there is an accident and we hit an iceberg i'm going to die so let's not do it then so what can you do about this so this is this is exactly the problem the the lifeboat feature exactly yeah so so somebody else in the chat put just pointed out the goal is to predict it at boarding time so it is wrong to use the feature and we could have been easily seeing this so let's go into this process all i'm doing here it's basically I take the original data set and then I build the correlation matrix. And if I do this, then I see immediately that lifeboat and survived are highly correlated. And as I said before, sometimes this is okay. Um, that just makes it an easier task, okay? Sometimes a high correlation is just okay. If it's highly correlated with the label, well, it just makes it easier for the model to, to pick it up. But you should always check for those correlations and now start to think. In my opinion, there is no magic wand which can, at this moment, take away the human brain completely. So just keep the human in the loop. You can still support the human making this decision by, by calculating those correlations and looking to them. 
But now whenever you see something like that, you should start to think like, huh, is there maybe a problem um, down the road because I use this feature and I really shouldn't use it because I actually shouldn't have this information in the first place. And that's the reason why the correlation is so high. So whenever that is the case, then take it out. And if I do take it out just quickly, so here I just uh, basically remove invert means I, I basically not selecting it, I, I'm removing it. I remove the lifeboat feature, so just stop here, so now it's gone. Same problem, but just gone. I use the grain booster trees again, same setup otherwise, and now the performance actually drops to 80%. And this brings me to another problem. The problem really is that most data scientists are trained to get as accurate as possible. They, they basically always want to optimize, and that is their way of thinking, but this leads, they often lead to problems because it actually, it requires some braveness to say like, you know what, I dropped this feature because I really shouldn't use it, although it drops my accuracy from 97 to 80%. That actually is, it's, it's a hurting decision, but it is still the right one. Unfortunately, it's the opposite of what many people are, are trained to do. Okay, so, um, well, I, I basically um, summarized this already. So the confusion between correlation and causation, it is real. If you build machine learning models, it's actually quite simple to work around them. So first thing you always should do, you should always check for correlations before you even start modeling and then understand what they mean. And that is the part where I said like, well, I love automating machine learning whenever it works for all the tedious tasks, tedious tasks like feature selection and feature generation and, and um, model selection, parameter optimization. Those are all the things which absolutely have and should be automated. And basically all platforms more or less automate all of those tasks. But if you want to automate this decision making, that is dangerous because it will really require to have a full understanding of the world. And that is really, we are not quite there yet from an API perspective. So that's dangerous. Um, so let's, let's not, um, um, let's not go, go well into this risk here. I, yeah, somebody answered, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm using the software Rapid Miner. That was uh, the answer which was just asked. Uh, it's a f just one sentence then on that. It's a freely available um, open source based platform. So you can do everything from data prep to, to machine learning. If I have some time, I, I give you a little bit of platform overview at the end. Um, uh, probably not having enough time, but well, you can do a free download and try it out yourself. It's super easy to use. I mean, well, you will build in tutorials. You will need some time to get used to the to the end user interface. But from then, it's very effective to actually and efficient also well, uh, to, to build great machine learning models. Anyway, end of marketing. So good. Um, well, then after you understood the correlations, consider removing those factors where it really shouldn't be in the data set. In most of the cases, um, that's a piece of information which actually is not available at the point of time where you would do the prediction later on. So not always, but often this is really the, the part of the problem. Okay. So second big problem I see in practice uh, and an easy one to ruin your business completely, in fact. Um, for this one, I actually jump right into the demo. Um, this is around model validation. We saw the cross validation already, and most data scientists believe, well, that's all you need to do. But in fact, that is not true. There's a lot of things you can do wrong. Um, the first thing, I don't have enough time to actually go into this, but never ever use the training error for anything. Just forget completely about training errors. There's some misconception in the world, but for many data scientists, as well, it might be good to detect overfitting, but not even that is true. I could explain to you if you would have more time, but forget them, just forget them. But um, when it comes to model validation, it's so easy to make a mistake. And part of this is, since we just talked about software, is because most platforms, especially the visual ones, don't support to do it in the right way, um, the, the validation of models. And even if you program in R or Python or some other program language way, in theory, you could do it in the right way. It's an amazing, amazingly huge amount of work to validate models in the correct way. So it's just easier to do it wrongly. And for that reason, most people just do it. I mean, many people don't know, know how to do it right. But even if you know how to do it right, it just often is a, is a pain. So, um, but I, I would still like to point it out because it is dangerous. Here is a different data set. It's... The SONAR data, it's, uh, I will show you the data in a second. Well, let me just run this process here. So it's not a huge data set, only 200 uh, rows and 60 columns, those regular ones, the white ones here. This is what the input for the model should be. And then we have this class here. We have rocks versus mines. So here down at the, at the bottom, but again, it will be randomized. So don't worry about that. Um, so those are the, our two classes here. And our goal is to predict if it's a rock or a mine. So this data is, our frequency is it's a frequency spectrum uh, from a sonar, 
and it's on a it's actually a military application so it's some boat and there's the sonar and they would like to detect mines and of course in order to detect a, like like a mine uh, they need to distinguish it from rocks and that problem is actually harder than you might think so if I look into the some charts here so I'm not going to all the details here but let's go with this one quickly here now every row in the data set is now one line in this parallel plot and as you can clearly see we want to distinguish between the red and the blue lines but it looks just like chaos it's not easy to see the differences here well there might be some area maybe here to the left or here to the right and in fact if i use a different visualization it's easier to see that in fact although there is so much overlap there are certain areas in the frequency spectrum like here and on the left in the middle a little bit and here on the right um, those three four areas where the um, rocks and the mines differ um, so it's hard for a human being it's not certainly not a single attribute or two which are sufficient to actually make the difference the, the difference so it's a combination of attributes or, or influence factors and that makes the problem a bit hard so we could basically train a model now just like we did before but this time I'm not using um, a gradient booster trees I'm using a K nearest neighbor modeling scheme and in fact, I'm using a cosine similarity, but I could use whatever uh, Euclidean distance or anything else, it doesn't really matter. But whatever I use, whatever I use, um, there is one important thing, because the data is not normalized, some of the data ranges, like here in the middle, are just larger than here, the ones on the, on, on, on the edges. And that means that the, the attributes here, the columns in the middle of our data set, will have a higher impact on the similarity. So what we really need to do is, basically bring this this whole data set uh, and normalize it so that actually all the ranges are the same so we need to do this so that's called normalization and most people would also often because they don't have another choice for doing this as i said before from from the software here from 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 the software perspective um they would basically just take a normalization like here and put it in front of the cross relation so they load in the data then they normalize the data and then they build and validate the model and if i do this Let's run this whole process. Um, everything works fine, no problem at all with this. And I get an accuracy in this case of 86.6%. Let's remember this number for a second, it's 86.6. And if you look at this accuracy now, we think like, oh, that's quite okay. But what is the problem here? I mean, what is the mistake? We just made in wrongly validating the model. Again, time for you guys. Um, think about this, uh, write into the chat. What do you think might have been the mistake we just made? And whatever ideas you might have, write it into the chat. The data for cross validation is not normalized. Well, it is, in fact. I mean, after, after this one here, uh, let's do two breakpoints. The first one here, if I look into the statistics here, so you can get basically all the data and, and have a look into, into the distribution and everything else, you can open the charts and whatever. Um, you see basically while well, the standard the the average is some value and the standard deviation is, is um, uh, some other value but after I think I put, picked a number 11 the average is zero the deviation is one so they're all normalized you put information from the testing data into the training and that is by normalizing before that is exactly right I just kind of cheated I leaked information no no Marco got it right so it's not an unbalanced data set I just leaked information why because for in order to do the normalization I look at the complete data set, all the data, and apply those factors to the complete data set before I even start doing the modeling and the validation. And that is just wrong. Because in fact, I mean, this is kind of the only thing uh, we really did. So it could have been quite obvious that this was a mistake. But what we should do is we should go inside of the cross validation, should first normalize on the training data, and then on the normalized training data learner model, and then I deliver what we call the pre-processing model in RepMiner here over to the test side. And on the test side, we apply this pre-processing model with the same parameters than the one we learned from the training set. So we, we, we never looked at the, at the test set basically at this point and apply this um, to, the, to the test data set here. And then we then apply the predictive model on the transformed test data sets using the transformation factors from the training. So it's been, because, the normalization you could see it like being part of the modeling and if i now run this whole process here we see that actually the accuracy dropped from 86.6 to 85.6 and you might argue well what's the point it's one percent it doesn't matter well you might be right one percent might not matter that much but that is just one mistake you made and then you do the same mistake with other pre-processing operators you might use 
uh, for feature selection. For example, I look into the whole data set. So basically, whenever you do a data preprocessing, which which basically transforms the data set by the information available in the whole data set and not just for every single role, you will introduce this information leak. And whatever you do before you do the modeling and validation, this will, or has at least the potential, not in all cases, but has the potential to, to change the accuracy to the better. So you get to an over optimistic estimation of how well your model actually works in practice. And that is probably the most frequent mistake I see people doing. And those mistakes, they all add up. I mean, right now, we just brought it from 85 to 86%. And then now I do feature selection. I bring it from 86 to 89. And then I do another step and I bring it from 89 to 92. And then I end up like after all my optimization with 95% instead of 85. I think like, woohoo, my model is 10% better than my starting model. But in fact, after you put it into production, the accuracy will drop back to the 85%. You just didn't know about this. And this is exactly how you can ruin yourself. Why? Because let's just imagine, here's just a simple example. You are losing $200 million per year due to customer churn. I mean, every company has churn. Let's say this is some insurance, they lose $200 million per year, whatever. Now you created a machine learning model and you did an improper validation, a wrong validation, and you thought this was going to reduce the churn rate by 20%. That means by $40 million. But this reduction, of course, is not coming for free. I mean, the model is just taking and telling you, well, th this person's at risk. And maybe if you do prescriptive analytics, you might even figure out things like, yeah, well, you should do, for example, go offer him a better service or give him the discount. And that will cost you money. So let's say um, you basically figure out what are the right cause of action, and those will cost you 20 million. So that's an investment of 20 million, but you will get back 40 million of, because of reduced churn. Sure, that's still a very good investment. Let's do it. But then afterwards, after you went to the production, you realize, oops, the reduction of the churn rate, in fact, is not 20%. It just looks like 20% because of the wrong validation. It was only 5%, so meaning you now save 10 million revenues, and that just turned the 20 million gain you have been hoping for into a $10 million loss. Ouch. This data scientist should be now looking for a new job. So my point is that actually is, well, kind of the, the biggest problem um, I've seen in the past. It's Everybody's so focused on building better models and doing the validation the wrong way makes the model look much better. And that's why people actually fall into this risk. So uh, what can you do to avoid those problems? First of all, you should ignore training errors completely. I didn't show it to you. They're very simple examples like why this is a really bad idea. Um, so just ignore it completely is my, my simplest piece of advice on this one. I, unless you really know what you're doing, forget them. Always use cross-validation. Um, and that should be possible for any real data science solution. Unfortunately, for many of the visual ones, um, that's not even the case. But but yeah, always use a cross-validation. But that's not enough. You always need to put the transformations, all data transformations, which actually work across multiple or all the rows inside of the cross-validation. And again, just as a reminder, because at the latest at that point, just take out all information, which is not available at the point of prediction. So. I have one last example, but I'm running out of time. So um, I, I, sorry, I spent a little bit too much time on, on, um, on in the beginning. Um, so I will just I will skip the demo part on, on this one here and just give you um, the, the the gist of it in, in like one minute. So the the whole idea here is um, that most data scientists, especially the less experienced one, and I understand them. I was exactly like them in the beginning. They, they really have the following approach. They receive the data, they don't care because the algorithms don't care, Math, the mathematics don't care. So it always works this, in the same way. So then they sound, think about the most complicated sounding model, model possible and just mindlessly plug all the data into this. And then they validate it and then they shoot the results over to the line of business. Nobody understands anything and nothing happens. So I see this happening a little bit too often. And part of this problem why nothing happens is because nobody understands what's going on. And this is, of course, even more problematic with more complex models like, like um, random forest or grain boosted with trees with thousands of trees. Or think about deep learning um, where you have a neural net at the end which are multiple layers and hundreds of nodes and hundreds of weights and nobody understands anything. So there are some ways around that, obviously, but, but you can't really build the necessary trust. And my claim is that often it's a better idea to invest more into feature engineering. And again, I had a nice demo, but I'm skipping it. To invest more into feature engineering uh, than into the modeling. And that actually will help you to come up with better, easy, understandable models, which are also more robust. They might perform less accurate, but at the same time, less accuracy often comes also with the advantage of being more robust and, and um, predicting um, new data 
in a better way. So start with the simple models and take it from there. And feature engineering is really extremely powerful. That's why deep learning works so well, because it's kind of like has this built in feature engineering. But I think if you do it explicitly, you have also the, the big advantage of understandability and more robustness, and both are valuable. Okay, before I end, like in a minute, uh, just a quick uh, wrap about ourselves. Um, I mean, um, I, I didn't want to bore you with like hundreds of marketing slides, so I'll be quick here. But I think data science is can be a risky uh, business if you do it wrong. Um, if you oversimplify things, then you shouldn't do it at all, really. But if you want to do real data science in a fast and simple way, um, that's exactly what our mission always has been. So talk to us, um, reach out to us. This is this is really what we stand for, what we are strong at. Um, there's this complete platform I mentioned uh, before for, for RapidBiner covering all the steps from data prep, modeling, and validation, of course, but also the operationalization of modeling the models and put them into production. Number one everywhere, leaders with Gartner for so you're just awesome. And with that, I wrap it. Um, so here's the key takeaways. Always check for correlations before modeling. Always cross-related models and the data preparation and use common sense and feature engineering before you try the fancy models. And of course, use RapidMiner for all of this. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.